Alhazen was an Arab mathematician, astronomer, and physicist of the Islamic Golden Age. Also sometimes referred to as the father of modern optics, he made significant contributions to the principles of optics and visual perception in particular, his most influential work being his Kitab al-Manazir or Book of Optics, written during 1011-1021, which survived in the Latin edition. A polymath, he also wrote on philosophy, theology and medicine. Alhazen was the first to explain that vision occurs when light reflects from an object and then passes to one's eyes. He was also the first to demonstrate that vision occurs in the brain, rather than in the eyes. Building upon a naturalistic, empirical method pioneered by Aristotle in ancient Greece, Alhazen was an early proponent of the concept that a hypothesis must be supported by experiments based on confirmable procedures or mathematical evidence, thusly, coming to an understanding of the scientific method, which came five centuries before Renaissance scientists. Heliocentrism is the astronomical model in which the Earth and planets revolve around the Sun at the center of the solar system. Historically, heliocentrism was opposed to geocentrism, which placed the Earth at the center. At the 16th century that a mathematical model of a heliocentric system was presented, by the Renaissance mathematician, astronomer, and Catholic cleric Nicolaus Copernicus, leading to the Copernican Revolution. In the following century, Johannes Kepler introduced elliptical orbits, and Galileo Galilei presented supporting observations made using a telescope. Between 1589 and 1592, the Italian scientist Galileo Galilei is said to have dropped two spheres of different masses from the Leaning Tower of Pisa to demonstrate that their time of descent was independent of their mass. Galileo discovered through this experiment that the objects fell with the same acceleration, proving his prediction true, while at the same time disproving Aristotle's theory of gravity, which states that objects fall at speed proportional to their mass. Most historians consider it to have been a thought experiment rather than a physical test. Inertia is the resistance of any physical object to any change in its velocity. This includes changes to the object's speed, or direction of motion. An aspect of this property is the tendency of objects to keep moving in a straight line at a constant speed, when no forces act upon them. Galileo writes that all external impediments removed, a heavy body on a spherical surface concentric with the Earth will maintain itself in that state in which it has been, if placed in movement towards the west, it will maintain itself in that movement. This notion which is termed circular inertia or horizontal circular inertia. For Galileo, a motion is horizontal if it does not carry the moving body towards or away from the center of the Earth, and for him, a ship, for instance, having once received some impetus through the tranquil sea, would move continually around our globe without ever stopping. It is also worth noting that Galileo later in 1632 concluded that based on this initial premise of inertia, it is impossible to tell the difference between a moving object and a stationary one without some outside reference to compare it against. This observation ultimately came to be the basis for Einstein to develop the theory of special relativity. Concepts of inertia in Galileo's writings would later come to be refined, modified and codified by Isaac Newton as the first of his laws of motion. Everybody perseveres in its state of rest, or of uniform motion in a right line, unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed thereon. Snell's law or the law of refraction is a formula used to describe the relationship between the angles of incidence and refraction, when referring to light or other waves passing through a boundary between two different isotropic media, such as water, glass, or air. In optics, the law is used in ray tracing to compute the angles of incidence or refraction, and in experimental optics to find the refractive index of a material. The law is also satisfied in metamaterials, which allow light to be bent backward at a negative angle of refraction with a negative refractive index. Ptolemy, in Alexandria, Egypt, had found a relationship regarding refraction angles, but it was inaccurate for angles that were not small. Ptolemy was confident he had found an accurate empirical law, partially as a result of fudging his data to fit theory. Alhazen, in his Book of Optics, came closer to discovering the law of refraction, though he did not take this step. The law eventually named after Snell was first accurately described by the Persian scientist Ibn Sal at the Baghdad court in 984. 
In the manuscript on burning mirrors and lenses, Saul used the law to derive lens shapes that focus light with no geometric aberrations. In 1621, Snell derived a mathematically equivalent form, that remained unpublished during his lifetime. Pascal's law, also Pascal's principle or the principle of transmission of fluid pressure, is a principle in fluid mechanics given by Blaise Pascal that states that a pressure change at any point in a confined incompressible fluid is transmitted throughout the fluid such that the same change occurs everywhere. The law was established by French mathematician Blaise Pascal. A change in pressure at any point in an enclosed fluid at rest is transmitted undiminished to all points in the fluid. Alternate definition, the pressure applied to any part of the enclosed liquid will be transmitted equally in all the direction through the liquid. Hooke's law is a law of physics that states that the force needed to extend or compress a spring by some distance scales linearly with respect to that distance. The law is named after 17th-century British physicist Robert Hooke. He first stated the law in 1676 as a Latin anagram. He published the solution of his anagram in 1678 as, utensio, sic vis, as the extension, so the force, or, the extension is proportional to the force. Hooke states in the 1678 work that he was aware of the law already in 1660. Hooke's equation holds in many other situations where an elastic body is deformed, such as wind blowing on a tall building, and a musician plucking a string of a guitar. An elastic body or material for which this equation can be assumed is said to be linear elastic or hoechean. Newton's laws of motion are three physical laws that, together, laid the foundation for classical mechanics. They describe the relationship between a body and the forces acting upon it, and its motion in response to those forces. More precisely, the first law defines the force qualitatively, the second law offers a quantitative measure of the force, and the third asserts that a single isolated force doesn't exist. These three laws have been expressed in several ways, over nearly three centuries, and can be summarized as follows. First law, in an inertial frame of reference, an object either remains at rest or continues to move at a constant velocity, unless acted upon by a force. Second law, in an inertial frame of reference, the vector sum of the forces on an object is equal to the mass of that object multiplied by the acceleration of the object. Third law, when one body exerts a force on a second body, the second body simultaneously exerts a force equal in magnitude and opposite in direction on the first body. Newton's law of universal gravitation is usually stated that every particle attracts every other particle in the universe with a force which is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. The publication of the theory has become known as the first great unification, as it marked the unification of the previously described phenomena of gravity on Earth with known astronomical behaviors. This is a general physical law derived from empirical observations by what Isaac Newton called inductive reasoning. It is a part of classical mechanics and was formulated in Newton's work Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, The Principia, first published on 5 July 1687. When Newton presented Book I of the unpublished text in April 1686 to the Royal Society, Robert Hooke made a claim that Newton had obtained the inverse square law from him. In today's language, the law states that every point mass attracts every other point mass by a force acting along the line intersecting the two points. The force is proportional to the product of the two masses, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Calculus, originally called infinitesimal calculus or the calculus of infinitesimals, is the mathematical study of continuous change, in the same way that geometry is the study of shape and algebra is the study of generalizations of arithmetic operations. It has two major branches, differential calculus and integral calculus, the former concerns instantaneous rates of change, and the slopes of curves, while integral calculus concerns accumulation of quantities, and areas under or between curves. These two branches are related to each other by the fundamental theorem of calculus, and they make use of the fundamental notions of convergence of infinite sequences and infinite series to a well-defined limit. Infinitesimal calculus was developed independently in the late 17th century by Isaac Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. 
Today, calculus has widespread uses in science, engineering, and economics. The law of conservation of mass or principle of mass conservation states that for any system closed to all transfers of matter and energy, the mass of the system must remain constant over time, as the system's mass cannot change, so quantity can neither be added nor be removed. Therefore, the quantity of mass is conserved over time. The law implies that mass can neither be created nor destroyed, although it may be rearranged in space, or the entities associated with it may be changed in form. For example, in chemical reactions, the mass of the chemical components before the reaction is equal to the mass of the components after the reaction. Thus, during any chemical reaction and low-energy thermodynamic processes in an isolated system, the total mass of the reactants, or starting materials, must be equal to the mass of the products. The concept of mass conservation is widely used in many fields such as chemistry, mechanics, and fluid dynamics. Historically, mass conservation was demonstrated in chemical reactions independently by Mikhail Lomonosov and later rediscovered by Antoine Lavoisier in the late 18th century. The formulation of this law was of crucial importance in the progress from alchemy to the modern natural science of chemistry. The conservation of mass only holds approximately and is considered part of a series of assumptions coming from classical mechanics. The law has to be modified to comply with the laws of quantum mechanics and special relativity under the principle of mass-energy equivalence, which states that energy and mass form one conserved quantity. For very energetic systems the conservation of mass only is shown not to hold, as is the case in nuclear reactions and particle-antiparticle annihilation in particle physics. Mass is also not generally conserved in open systems. Such is the case when various forms of energy and matter are allowed into, or out of, the system. However, unless radioactivity or nuclear reactions are involved, the amount of energy escaping or entering such systems as heat, mechanical work, or electromagnetic radiation is usually too small to be measured as a decrease or increase in the mass of the system. For systems where large gravitational fields are involved, general relativity has to be taken into account, where mass-energy conservation becomes a more complex concept, subject to different definitions, and neither mass nor energy is as strictly and simply conserved as is the case in special relativity. Coulomb's law, or Coulomb's inverse square law, is an experimental law of physics that quantifies the amount of force between two stationary, electrically charged particles. The electric force between charged bodies at rest is conventionally called electrostatic force or Coulomb force. The quantity of electrostatic force between stationary charges is always described by Coulomb's law. The law was first published in 1785 by French physicist Charles Augustin de Coulomb, and was essential to the development of the theory of electromagnetism, maybe even its starting point, because it was now possible to discuss quantity of electric charge in a meaningful way. Being an inverse square law, the law is analogous to Isaac Newton's inverse square law of universal gravitation, but gravitational forces are always attractive, while electrostatic forces can be attractive or repulsive. Coulomb's law can be used to derive Gauss's law, and vice versa. In the case of a single stationary point charge, the two laws are equivalent, expressing the same physical law in different ways. Thomas Young was a British polymath who made notable contributions to the fields of vision, light, solid mechanics, energy, physiology, language, musical harmony, and Egyptology. In Young's own judgment, of his many achievements the most important was to establish the wave theory of light. To do so, he had to overcome the century-old view, expressed in the venerable Newton's optics, that light is a particle. Nevertheless, in the early 19th century Young put forth a number of theoretical reasons supporting the wave theory of light, and he developed two enduring demonstrations to support this viewpoint. With the ripple tank he demonstrated the idea of interference in the context of water waves. With Young's interference experiment, or double-slit experiment, he demonstrated interference in the context of light as a wave. Young, speaking on 24 November 1803, to the Royal Society of London, began his now classic description of the historic experiment. The experiments I am about to relate, may be repeated with great ease, whenever the sun shines, and without any other apparatus than is at hand to everyone. 
In his subsequent paper, titled Experiments and Calculations Relative to Physical Optics on 1804, Young describes an experiment in which he placed a card measuring approximately 0.85 mm in a beam of light from a single opening in a window and observed the fringes of color in the shadow and to the sides of the card. He observed that placing another card in front or behind the narrow strip so as to prevent the light beam from striking one of its edges caused the fringes to disappear. This supported the contention that light is composed of waves. Young performed and analyzed a number of experiments, including interference of light from reflection off nearby pairs of micrometer grooves, from reflection off thin films of soap and oil, and from Newton's rings. He also performed two important diffraction experiments using fibers and long narrow strips. In his course of lectures on natural philosophy and the mechanical arts on 1807 he gives Grimaldi credit for first observing the fringes in the shadow of an object placed in a beam of light. Within ten years, much of Young's work was reproduced and then extended by Augustin Jean Fresnel. The most important of all Dalton's investigations are concerned with the atomic theory in chemistry. While his name is inseparably associated with this theory, the origin of Dalton's atomic theory is not fully understood. The theory may have been suggested to him either by researches on ethylene and methane or by analysis of nitrous oxide and nitrogen dioxide, both views resting on the authority of Thomas Thomson. From 1814 to 1819, Irish chemist William Higgins claimed that Dalton had plagiarized his ideas, but Higgins' theory did not address relative atomic mass. However, recent evidence suggests that Dalton's development of thought may have been influenced by the ideas of another Irish chemist Brian Higgins, who was William's uncle. Brian believed that an atom was a heavy central particle surrounded by an atmosphere of caloric, the supposed substance of heat at the time. The size of the atom was determined by the diameter of the caloric atmosphere. Based on the evidence, Dalton was aware of Brian's theory and adopted very similar ideas and language, but he never acknowledged Brian's anticipation of his caloric model. However, the essential novelty of Dalton's atomic theory is that he provided a method of calculating relative atomic weights for the chemical elements, something that neither Brian nor William Higgins did, his priority for that crucial step is uncontested. A study of Dalton's laboratory notebooks, discovered in the rooms of the Manchester Literary and Philosophical Society, concluded that so far from Dalton being led by his search for an explanation of the law of multiple proportions to the idea that chemical combination consists in the interaction of atoms of definite and characteristic weight, the idea of atoms arose in his mind as a purely physical concept, forced on him by study of the physical properties of the atmosphere and other gases. The first published indications of this idea are to be found at the end of his paper, on the absorption of gases by water and other liquids already mentioned. There he says, why does not water admit its bulk of every kind of gas alike? This question I have duly considered, and though I am not able to satisfy myself completely I am nearly persuaded that the circumstance depends on the weight and number of the ultimate particles of the several gases. He then proposes relative weights for the atoms of a few elements, without going into further detail. The main points of Dalton's atomic theory, as it eventually developed, are, 1. Elements are made of extremely small particles called atoms. 2. Atoms of a given element are identical in size, mass and other properties, atoms of different elements differ in size, mass and other properties. 3. Atoms cannot be subdivided, created or destroyed. 4. Atoms of different elements combine in simple whole number ratios to form chemical compounds. 5. In chemical reactions, atoms are combined, separated or rearranged. André-Marie Ampère was a French physicist and mathematician who was one of the founders of the science of classical electromagnetism, which he referred to as «electrodynamics». He is also the inventor of numerous applications, such as the solenoid and the electrical telegraph. In September 1820, Ampere's friend and eventual eulogist François Arago showed the members of the French Academy of Sciences the surprising discovery of Danish physicist Hans Christian Ørsted that a magnetic needle is deflected by an adjacent electric current. Ampere began developing a mathematical and physical theory to understand the relationship between electricity and magnetism. 
Furthering Orsted's experimental work, Ampere showed that two parallel wires carrying electric currents attract or repel each other, depending on whether the currents flow in the same or opposite directions, respectively, this laid the foundation of electrodynamics. He also applied mathematics in generalizing physical laws from these experimental results. The most important of these was the principle that came to be called Ampere's Law, which states that the mutual action of two lengths of current carrying wire is proportional to their lengths and to the intensities of their currents. Ampere also applied this same principle to magnetism, showing the harmony between his law and French physicist Charles Augustin de Coulomb's Law of Magnetic Action. Ampere's devotion to, and skill with, experimental techniques anchored his science within the emerging fields of experimental physics. Ampere also provided a physical understanding of the electromagnetic relationship, theorizing the existence of an electrodynamic molecule that served as the component element of both electricity and magnetism. Using this physical explanation of electromagnetic motion, Ampere developed a physical account of electromagnetic phenomena that was both empirically demonstrable and mathematically predictive. In 1827 Ampere published his memoir on the mathematical theory of electrodynamic phenomena, uniquely deduced from experience, the work that coined the name of his new science, Electrodynamics, and became known ever after as its founding treatise. The electrical resistance of an electrical conductor is a measure of the difficulty of passing an electric current through a substance. It explains the relationship between voltage and the current. With more resistance in a circuit, less electricity will flow through the circuit. For many materials, the current through the material is proportional to the voltage applied across it. Therefore, the resistance and conductance of objects or electronic components made of these materials is constant. This relationship is called Ohm's law, and materials which obey it are called ohmic materials. Examples of ohmic components are wires and resistors. The current voltage graph of an ohmic device consists of a straight line through the origin with positive slope. Electromagnetic or magnetic induction is the production of an electromotive force across an electrical conductor in a changing magnetic field. Michael Faraday is generally credited with the discovery of induction in 1831, and James Clerk Maxwell mathematically described it as Faraday's law of induction. Lenz's law describes the direction of the induced field. Faraday's law was later generalized to become the Maxwell-Faraday equation, one of the four Maxwell equations in his theory of electromagnetism. Electromagnetic induction has found many applications, including electrical components such as inductors and transformers, and devices such as electric motors and generators. The second law of thermodynamics states that the total entropy of an isolated system can never decrease over time, and is constant if and only if all processes are reversible. Isolated systems spontaneously evolve towards thermodynamic equilibrium, the state with maximum entropy. The total entropy of a system and its surroundings can remain constant in ideal cases where the system is in thermodynamic equilibrium, or is undergoing a fictive reversible process. In all processes that occur, including spontaneous processes, the total entropy of the system and its surroundings increases and the process is irreversible in the thermodynamic sense. The increase in entropy accounts for the irreversibility of natural processes, and the asymmetry between future and past. The second law of thermodynamics may be expressed in many specific ways, the most prominent classical statements being the statement by Rudolf Clausius in 1854, the statement by Lord Kelvin in 1851. The German scientist Rudolf Clausius laid the foundation for the second law of thermodynamics in 1850 by examining the relation between heat transfer and work. His formulation of the second law, which was published in German in 1854, is known as the Clausius statement, heat can never pass from a colder to a warmer body without some other change, connected therewith, occurring at the same time. The statement by Clausius uses the concept of passage of heat. As is usual in thermodynamic discussions, this means, net transfer of energy is heat, and does not refer to contributory transfers one way and the other. Heat cannot spontaneously flow from cold regions to hot regions without external work being performed on the system, which is evident from ordinary experience of refrigeration, for example. 
In a refrigerator, heat flows from cold to hot, but only when forced by an external agent, the refrigeration system. Lord Kelvin expressed the second law in several wordings. It is impossible for a self-acting machine, unaided by any external agency, to convey heat from one body to another at a higher temperature. It is impossible, by means of inanimate material agency, to derive mechanical effect from any portion of matter by cooling it below the temperature of the coldest of the surrounding objects. In 1856 August Kronig created a simple gas kinetic model, which only considered the translational motion of the particles. In 1857 Rudolf Clausius, according to his own words independently of Kronig, developed a similar, but much more sophisticated version of the theory which included translational and contrary to Kronig also rotational and vibrational molecular motions. In this same work he introduced the concept of mean free path of a particle. In 1859, after reading a paper on the diffusion of molecules by Rudolf Clausius, Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell formulated the Maxwell distribution of molecular velocities, which gave the proportion of molecules having a certain velocity in a specific range. This was the first ever statistical law in physics. Maxwell also gave the first mechanical argument that molecular collisions entail an equalization of temperatures and hence a tendency towards equilibrium. In his 1873 13-page article, Molecules, Maxwell states, we are told that an atom is a material point, invested and surrounded by potential forces, and that when flying molecules strike against a solid body in constant succession it causes what is called pressure of air and other gases. A black body is an idealized physical body that absorbs all incident electromagnetic radiation, regardless of frequency or angle of incidence. It does not only absorb radiation, but can also emit radiation. The name, black body, is given because it absorbs radiation in all frequencies, not because it only absorbs. The idea of a black body originally was introduced by Gustav Kirchhoff in 1860 as follows, dot the supposition that bodies can be imagined which, for infinitely small thicknesses, completely absorb all incident rays, and neither reflect nor transmit any. I shall call such bodies perfectly black, or, more briefly, black bodies. Kirchhoff introduced the theoretical concept of a perfect black body with a completely absorbing surface layer of infinitely small thickness, but Planck noted some severe restrictions upon this idea. Planck noted three requirements upon a black body, the body must. 1. Allow radiation to enter but not reflect. 2. Possess a minimum thickness adequate to absorb the incident radiation and prevent its re-emission. 3. Satisfy severe limitations upon scattering to prevent radiation from entering and bouncing back out. In statistical mechanics, entropy is an extensive property of a thermodynamic system. In the 1850s and 1860s, German physicist Rudolf Clausius objected to the supposition that no change occurs in the working body, and gave this change a mathematical interpretation by questioning the nature of the inherent loss of usable heat when work is done, for example, heat produced by friction. Clausius described entropy as the transformation content, for example, dissipative energy use, of a thermodynamic system or working body of chemical species during a change of state. This was in contrast to earlier views, based on the theories of Isaac Newton, that heat was an indestructible particle that had mass. Later, scientists such as Ludwig Boltzmann, Josiah Willard Gibbs, and James Clerk Maxwell gave entropy a statistical basis. In 1877 Boltzmann visualized a probabilistic way to measure the entropy of an ensemble of ideal gas particles, in which he defined entropy as proportional to the natural logarithm of the number of microstates such a gas could occupy. Henceforth, the essential problem in statistical thermodynamics has been to determine the distribution of a given amount of energy E over n identical systems. Carathéodory linked entropy with a mathematical definition of irreversibility, in terms of trajectories and integrability. A Dynamical Theory of the Electromagnetic Field is a paper by James Clerk Maxwell on electromagnetism, published in 1865. In the paper, Maxwell derives an electromagnetic wave equation with a velocity for light in close agreement with measurements made by experiment, and deduces that light is an electromagnetic wave. 
He obtained a wave equation with a speed in close agreement to experimental determinations of the speed of light. He commented, the agreement of the results seems to show that light and magnetism are affections of the same substance, and that light is an electromagnetic disturbance propagated through the field according to electromagnetic laws. Maxwell's theory predicted that coupled electric and magnetic fields could travel through space as an electromagnetic wave. Maxwell proposed that light consisted of electromagnetic waves of short wavelength, but no one had been able to prove this, or generate or detect electromagnetic waves of other wavelengths. During Hertz's studies in 1879 Helmholtz suggested that Hertz's doctoral dissertation be on testing Maxwell's theory. Helmholtz had also proposed the Berlin Prize problem that year at the Prussian Academy of Sciences for anyone who could experimentally prove an electromagnetic effect in the polarization and depolarization of insulators, something predicted by Maxwell's theory. Helmholtz was sure Hertz was the most likely candidate to win it. Not seeing any way to build an apparatus to experimentally test this, Hertz thought it was too difficult, and worked on electromagnetic induction instead. Hertz did produce an analysis of Maxwell's equations during his time at Kiel, showing they did have more validity than the then prevalent action at a distance theories. Has anything been forgotten? Please commented. In the following sections, we will have exciting stories of quantum physics, general relativity, and fundamental particles. Subscribe us so you don't miss anything.